Sadashiva Samarambam Shankara Chaya Madhyamam Asmadachaya Payantam Vande Guru Param Param Ishvaro Guratmeti Murti Veda Vivagine Vyoma Vadya Pradeaya Dakshina Murtaye Namaha Sarva Vedanta Siddhanta Gosharam Tamagosharam Govindam Paramanandam Sadhguru Tantosyam Om Sadashiva Samarambam In the beginning was Sadashiva, existence shining as consciousness. Shankar Acharya Madhyamam in the middle, Madhyamam, is Shankaracharya. Shankara clarified the meaning of the Upanishads and reduced all of Vedanta to a simple formula. Brahmasatyam Jagannitya. If you know what that means, you're a Vedanta person, you're a non-dualist, and you're free. Asmad Acharya Paryantam. And at the bottom of the lineage is my teacher, the present teacher who's teaching it. Sadashiva Samarambam Shankaracharya Madhyamam Asmad Acharya Paryantam Vande Guru Param Param. Vande means I worship, I bow to, I surrender, I offer myself uh, as a disciple, as an inquirer into this tradition. Who is that guru? Ishwaro Guratmeti, the guru is Ishwara. Ishwara means existence, shining as awareness. Ishwaro Gurat Meti Murti Beda Vibhagine. And who is that guru? Is beyond Murti, beyond names and forms, and beyond duality, Beda. Murti Beda Vibhagine Vyoma Vadvyapta Dehaya. It's beyond the earth, the physical dimension and it's clear are uncontaminated like space or the sky. Namaha. I bow to that God that's facing south. Facing south means sitting in the north. The north is where everything is frozen. That's the self. The one that looks out upon the what? The changing, ever-changing uh, world of names and forms, the Mitya world. Sarva Vedanta Siddhanta. What is the meaning of, or the import, the meaning of Vedanta? Sarva Vedanta Siddhanta. Gocharam Tama Gocharam. It's beyond what I can see with my eyes and beyond what I can infer with my mind. Beyond perception and inference. Gocharam Tama Gocharam. Govindam Paramanandam. What is that? That's the place where the light shines. Govindam. That's the keeper of the light. Govindam, and what is that? Govindam, param anandam. Ananda means bliss. Not object-generated bliss, but what? 
limitless bliss. Read this. Govindam Paramanandam Sadgurum. To that guru, that limitless, blissful, light, shining, existent light of awareness, uh, Sadgurum uh, Pranatosmiham. I surrender. So by understanding the meaning of and chanting that, you uh, have entered the stream this stream of knowledge that flows from the higher to the lower. You're surrendered to the tradition. And then, and from that point on, huh, then the teach, teaching is the guru, the teacher is the guru, Every, everybody you meet, all the people you meet and so forth are the guru. Everything is teaching you. I'm a learning person, I'm an awareful person learning entity. Uh, verse, uh, so we, st uh, last session, we, in, in verses 13 and 14, they said, uh, to abide in samadhi, to, to stay in samadhi, or to situate yourself in samadhi, uh, it, take, it's, it's, it takes some effort. It said, requires devoted, consistent, long-term practice, depending on your qualification, depending on how dispassionate and discriminating you are, that's how long it takes. Some people are, are highly dispassionate and discriminating. A very small percentage of, of people are, are all already temperamentally suited for this teaching. And for them, it doesn't take long at all. My, one of my gurus, Swami Abedananda, spent 20 minutes sitting in a cave with his guru. That was all it took for him. Uh, and what? Uh, because what? Because of which the mind, and because of this practice, the mind becomes quiet and one pointed. And we mentioned that that the one of the prerequisites, one of the qualifications for yoga is what? A simple lifestyle. Simply for what reason? So that the mind's available to what? To concentrate on what? On the self. To get to absorb and stay absorbed in the self. A simple uh, lifestyle without a lot of complications. If you have too much karma, it's just too difficult. And you won't do your karma yoga properly, you'll be conflicted. So it's better not to, better to stay with the karma yoga and simplify your life. Karma yoga, what? Reduces your karma load. So that, that what? that's a simplification in itself. A karma yoga qualifies you for that. And, uh, and what is the benefit of this samadhi practice? It says, when the mind, when the citta, the mind, is pacified, but you love yourself completely. <laughs> Why? Because you've taken the time to get rid of your suffering. You haven't just explained away your suffering and, and tried to do karma yoga on your suffering. You've actually transformed your lifestyle and your life and your whole way of thinking. And you'll like yourself when you do that. You love yourself a lot. A lot of most of us just put up with our suffering. We just have excuses and reasons why. Why why oh life's like that. It's just suffering. And no it's not. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that way. You if you want to justify your suffering by saying life's like that, well then go ahead. But you're still going to be suffering. So what's the point, really, when there's an alternative? So he says here. Um, and uh, it is pacified by what? Performing actions that conform to your highest value, which is what? Freedom and non-dual love. So I look at everything, if I'm clear about what my highest value is, 
that clarity uh, gives me the discrimination in every situation that's required for every situation. I just look at whether or not this activity, this, this thought, feeling, emotion, or action that I'm doing is what? Is, is in harmony with my goal or not? Because once you've entered this stream and become an inquirer, uh, then your dharma is set up. Your dharma is to follow the teaching. That's the dharma. You don't worry about your swa dharma. You can be a book, butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker. It doesn't matter. You, now you're looking at everything from that point of view. Is what I'm doing right? in harmony with my highest value? Am I doing it in the right way for the right reason? Animals don't evaluate themselves. They're very sensitive. They have a, their own kind of thinking, their own kind of feelings, and so forth and so on. But they don't have a, a capacity for self-evaluation. And therefore, they don't grow. They don't have karma because they don't choose. They don't make choices consciously. Their choices are made for them by Ishwar. If you don't opt to make the choices for yourself, opt, use your free will, you, if you don't opt to do so, then Ishwar will just what? Supply you with the default, and you'll just run off of Ishwar's default. So. And that's not always uh, what you want. So, this is it. And so, this passion, what, is a state of mind attained by what? What was the definition? That was, was, was a, uh, the last verse we took just before we uh, quit. Uh, and that, that is, uh, Vairagam is a state of mind attained by what? Non-craving for sense objects. Uh, Krishna says in the Gita, Therefore, O Arjuna, uh, uh, master the sense organs at the beginning. <laughs> Stand up to these feelings that you're having. Uh, don't let those feelings um, sway you. Because uh, Arjuna is indulging his feelings. And because of his indulgence in his feelings, what, what does he do? He justifies an adharmic action with dharmic reasons. Sympathetic dharmic reasons. He takes the moral high ground and signals his virtue as a caring, loving entity to do the wrong thing. What is the wrong thing? Not to kill Duryodhana. Not to kill that. The Duryodhana is in you. Duryodhana is the what? It's the selfish factor. It's the me factor. It's the hard, durable, obdurate. Obdurate means um, thick, heavy, rock-like. Uh, obsidian. Obsidian is a black, glassy rock made cooked in the heat of a volcano. It's hard. Everybody has that hard, selfish part. And it's a, your duty to what? To attack that. And you've been given the weapons to do that. What are the weapons? The scripture. The teacher and the teaching. That's, the, that's what you've got. Thank God that Ishwar was a friend of Krishna's. And somehow felt that Krishna had some something special. So when he found himself in this terrible situation, he went to his friend and asked for his help. And uh, and Krishna said, "Okay, I won't fight, but I'll be there for you." I'll, I'll be a presence in your life. Uh, so, now, so the verse that we're taking up now 
today or this this afternoon. Dispassion should be, and how long should I do this? How long should I practice this dispassion, this this samadhi? It should be developed until the yogi is what? Indifferent to both positive and negative states of mind. And what? And the chitta is unaffected by craving and aversion. That's duality, beta. The chitta just, so what? It's, everything's a big so what for these people. And it's not a negative so what. It's not a negative so what. It's a so what. <laughs> it's a very positive, friendly, uh, dispassionate, happy so what. So what? So you, this happened. Uh, you, did anybody ever read this? Camus, Albert Camus? You guys are Europeans. Remember the, the, the what is the most famous book, L'Etranger? Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what's the first verse in L'Etranger say? Aujourd'hui, Mama est mort. Ou peut-être hier. <laughs> Today, Mom died, or maybe it was yesterday. What? Your mother dies and you can't remember whether it was today or yesterday? Yeah, he couldn't because it, it wasn't a big event. Loved ones die. It doesn't they're they're dead while they're living. <laughs> That's the feeling of this dispassion. We're all living dead here. We're walking around, uh, and and the very fact that we live what means that we're dead. So this is how these people see it. So this is not a big deal. Life and death are not a big deal for that person. That's called vairagya, paramanandam. And so what does yoga and Vedanta do? They convert binding likes and dislikes. What does this look like, this, this state? To convert binding likes and dislikes, fears and desires into preferences. You can prefer it one way or the other, but if it doesn't happen, you're just as good, isn't it? I would prefer, you know, today I preferred those, that uh, lovely quiche that we had yesterday. <laughs> but, but we didn't have that lovely quiche that we had yesterday. Today. But, so I said, okay, let's see what this is. And the one I, that one we had today, that, that couscous, whatever it was, that was delicious. And all that stuff, oh, it was lovely. It's just as good. I wanted that, but this is what I got, and this is good. Right. And tomorrow, who knows? <laughs> you have your preferences, but, uh, but it's all good. I, I can meet the situation. I don't require the situation to meet me. I can come to it and bless it with my presence, with my acceptance. That's an appropriate way to respond to Ishwara. That's, that's loving Ishwara or serving Ishwara. And you serve Ishwara, I tell you, and Ishwara serves you in spades. You just can't imagine how much, what blessings uh, the more you come from service of Ishwara. There's just no limit to it. You can create the most amazing life, most absolutely fantastic life uh, with this attitude. Limitless dispassion is the nature of the self. Oh. Exists in China's awareness. And is gained by what samadhi and the yoga of the three energies. Gonna, we're going to throw in Triguna Vibhava Yoga because it boils down to the same thing. And the yoga of the three energies. Right? Vedanta says one attains supreme dispassion 
by, by negating the three energies with the understanding that the self is the energy-free witness of the gunas. What are, what are the three energies? What they're, uh, they're just three categories that take care of all our waking state experience. No, no thing. Every experience that we have is, is some permutation or combination of those three energies. Now, huh? so when you, as you live, you're aware of whether you're feeling tamasic or feeling rajasic or you're feeling sattvic, aren't you? Sattva, rajas, and tamas are energies. They're feelings, subtle feelings. Well, not so subtle. Rajas and tamas are not so subtle. Sattvic is, sattva is more a subtle feeling, but it's still a feeling. Well, those are those those feelings are what produced by what by what Maya. Aren't they? They're added to consciousness when Maya is operating. Maya means ignorance. So to negate them, what do I have to do? Subtract them. Well, I've given you several subtraction notions, just subtracting the body and mind. That's equivalent to subtracting the gunas because the body and mind are, are made out of what? The gunas. This is the gunas are the cause of everything down here. These are the cause, the unseen cause. We infer those. And these are, this is the seen effects. This is the cause and this is the effects. As whatever's up here is going to appear down here. Because uh, the, the effect is the cause in a form. This is formless, so we can't see it. But wh when, it, when it manifests, it becomes seen. This is unseen, adrishta. And this is seen. Okay. So if I can negate the cause... The effects are negated. Now, what does negate mean? Does it mean removing it? No. It means seeing it as an object, which is will be what? Mitya. Mitya, and obviously not me. I'm the one that knows my feelings. And all the feelings I have are subsumed in one of these. This is a depressing feeling. This is an exciting feeling. And this is a feeling of what? Of clarity and goodness and truth and beauty. You have those feelings. The sattva is dominant when you're feeling excited. Huh? That's rajas is dominant. And when you're feeling dull and depressed. Mm -hmm. well, that's Tamaguna. <laughs> how, how are those feelings known? They, they don't know themselves, do they? Because they're not sentient. They are insentient. They are material. Matter doesn't feel anything. I can whack it really hard. I can whack this chair very hard. It's not going to complain. Uh -huh. We are a mixture of sentient and insentient forces. A subtle body and what? A gross physical body. Did you, did you ever ask, uh, if, like for example, if I cut my finger here, right here, it will hurt. I'll feel something, won't I? But if I cut my fingernail, will it hurt? Well, fingernail's mine, and the finger's mine, isn't it? Both of them are mine. 
Why does this one not, this one feel and this one doesn't feel? Because the subtle body ends here. <laughs> and the gross body starts here. Huh? The, the hair. The hair is me. Isn't it? But you let your hair be cut, don't you? It's become quite fashionable to shave your hair, hair head nowadays. Huh? And nobody says, nobody's complaining it doesn't hurt. Because that's just the material me. And the rest is what? Subtle body is the feeling me. But whether it's a feeling me or a material me, what? It's known to me. So, I can't be it. We could say, it can be me, in the sense that it wouldn't exist without me. But I'm never going to become that. So, so the rem and that leaving things as it is is as good as destroying them completely. Why? Because they, the what the material part of me and the feeling part of me don't change me at all. No matter how miserable you're feeling, you're aware of that, aren't you? No matter huh? No matter how high and exhilarated you are, you're aware of that. That means what? The awareness is uncontaminated by what? By the feelings. By the depression or the elation. Is it? See how, see how simple this is? How, how incredibly simple. How, how basic. So there's nothing theoretical or... or uh, mystical about this at all. This is just something that I, I need to think about and see if it isn't true. We, we can't argue about this. We never have argument in Vedanta. There's no, there's no point. Because you can't argue with what is. You, <laughs> you either see it or you don't see it. So, so the way I destroy the world, the way I get rid of my ego, is to what? See my ego. There's nothing wrong with an ego. An ego is a functional entity that serves an absolutely important function in human beings. Animals and these in plants don't have egos. We have them because we have choices. Uh, we have free will and we make choices and therefore what? We need to make decisions. But that's just a decision-making factor here. The stimulus comes in, it goes up here, the response comes back, and the ego's got to decide, what should I do now? Should I uh, embrace this experience? Should I ignore this experience or should I run like hell? What should I do? It's a great blessing. Why, why would you want to kill your ego? Egoism is the feeling that what? That I'm doing it. <laughs> but the ego is absolutely essential, absolutely important. For a human being, we need that. And verse 17 to qualify for the liberating samadhi, practice these stages meditate on gross objects, subtle objects, bliss, and the witness of the preceding three. And and bliss, and bliss, the, it should be the, I got to make a little note here, bliss, comma, the witness of the preceding three. Now, does that mean, what does that mean? That means just understand these three categories, gross, subtle, huh? causal, 
and what? An awareness. This is the bliss sheet. This is the mental sheet, and this is the transactional sheet, the material sheet. And those are all what? Known by me. Awareness. There's a lot of... The, one of the problems with the yoga sutras is that as they appear is the, all the language, the Savitarka, the Savikalpa, the Nirvikalpa, uh, the Savichara, all these various words, they, they, they're confusing and people have a really hard time relating them, relating to them, because they're Sanskrit words. Uh, but but they're they're all so I just clean them up mostly and just I, I usually put them as you'll notice as a parenthesis behind the word. So if the word is there and, it, and, it, and a Sanskrit word appears behind it, that that's the meaning of that word. And 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 forget the Sanskrit because uh, it's, it's way too much. Some of the Sanskrit we need, obviously. A little bit we can need. The gunas and those things, we need those words. So we're keeping those words because those concepts are way too subtle. Dharma. Dharma is another word we need to keep because it's a really nuanced, deep concept that has many aspects to it. And so we need to retain that word and then explain in detail what that, all the ramifications of that word, what what, the, what all the things that that word means, and in what context that that word is appropriate. So, so, so there's basically four four things, <laughs> four things happening all at the same time. We're talking cause and effect, but obviously cause and effect is just a tool that we use to teach. Uh, to explain the structure of this, of reality. But these four things are always present. Awareness is shining. The bliss sheet, the causal body is there generating what? Experience. Uh, the mind, uh, the mind, intellect, and ego here, the subtle body is always functioning. It's thinking and feeling and, and willing, discriminating. Uh, there's actually four functions to the four functions to the mind. It's a very very sophisticated instrument actually. It, what does it do? It integrates sense information. It generates doubts. It generates emotions, and what does it do? It acts as a traffic cop. It directs consciousness to the organ that's what most appropriate for gaining knowledge at the mo at, 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 at any moment. So that's quite a sophisticated instrument. It, it assumes, it, obviously if you were involved in any of this, you, you'd have no time to do anything. <laughs> All these factors that are causing actions and causing your life causing things to happen here. Um, those are called karakas, or the constituents of action. And all of the factors here are required for the production of any single action. If you remove any one of the factors from this, from this chart, any one, uh, the, the whole universe collapses. It just poof, it just goes. That's amazing, isn't it, when you think about it? You can't do because it's all what? It's all cooked up. It's all a dream. Every single thing is interdependent, interlocked. That's why the colors are all huh, harmonious, how, why they're coded throughout. And all the structures. Look at this structure. Look at what a beautiful structure this is. This is a picture of a healthy, a healthy human being. This is what you look like when you're, uh, when you've attained samadhi or what, or you know who you are, what you are. 
you look like this. Everything spinning around naturally, automatically, spontaneously, by God's grace. And I, I just observing it. You're observing it now, but it's a bit of a mess. <laughs> well, it's a little messy. You know, if you're happy with a mess, well, I guess you can keep it. I, I'm not happy with a mess. I, I'm very uh, compulsive, or you know, I, I want it, I'm a fanatic. I want everything perfect. I worked really hard to get it all perfect. You never gets perfect, but that doesn't matter. Uh, it's all, there's always some imperfection here, but uh, I want to make it as perfect and pure and beautiful and as holy uh, and as as welcoming and loving as possible. Uh, it's the attitude. So, so what? Here's the word. Here's the fancy word. Savitarka. What does it mean? It just means logically. Savi tarka, tarka means logic, and Savi means with, so with logic, so it means logically. But Savi Tarka Samadhi, <laughs> Savi Kalpa Samadhi, <laughs> oh, the, how do I do that one? <laughs> There's nothing magical about it, it's just uh, using logic. What is the logic? This, logic is what? Necessary for knowledge. Because this thing we want to know, you can't directly perceive it. You need to you make a few steps, logical steps, to get to the understanding. Like, for instance, uh, uh, how, how do you how do you how do you equate consciousness and existence? What what logical steps do I mean? Because they're two different words, aren't they? It's two different ones: existence and one's consciousness. Now, is that refer to two different things? It refers to one thing. Well, what's the logic behind that? Because it seems illogical. Why, why not just have one word? If it's just one thing, let's just have one word. But you have two words, existence and consciousness, referring to the same thing. Well, can I know that something... Can't, does something exist unless I know that it exists? No. And what? And can I know something exists unless I'm conscious? Huh? Mm -hmm. And I can't be conscious unless consciousness exists, can I? And and what? And can consciousness if consciousness doesn't exist then then if existence, in other words, if consciousness doesn't exist, then there's no consciousness, is there? So consciousness depends upon existence, and existence depends upon consciousness. They're the same thing. They're just different words explaining the same phenomenon. It's not a phenomenon, it is, but in terms of, a, of, a, of objects, it's a phenomenon. I can't know that I exist unless I exist, and I don't exist unless I know that I exist. There you are. I throw the, I have to throw the knowledge in there because uh, because knowledge is dependent upon consciousness, isn't it? Can you know something and that's consciousness is there? Now, if you have material objects, they don't they don't seem to have consciousness, but what? They are consciousness. Why? Because they exist. So you can say this is consciousness. You can't say it's conscious because it doesn't have a subtle body. But you can say it's consciousness because it exists. My fingernail. You can't say it's conscious, but you can't say it isn't consciousness. Why? Because it exists. And consciousness can't, uh, if consciousness doesn't exist, then there isn't consciousness, is there? And existence isn't going to exist unless I know that it exists. So 
Existence requires consciousness, and consciousness requires existence. So that's it. They're the same thing. Anyway, so this is logic. Understanding the reason. You can, you can memorize this, but that's not going to be that enough. There'll always be a doubt. And that doubt will drive you crazy. But when you start, huh, when you just meditate on the logic and, and understand the logic, then what? No more doubt comes. This is called nishchaya. In other words, moksha, freedom, is called nishchaya. It means without doubt or a firm conviction, a conviction that you can't, that that's not going to be, that can't be changed by anything. This is who I am. This is what I am. Okay. Logically investigate the nature of gross matter. What does this mean? So he says here, he says, practice these things, meditate on gross objects. So it says here, so what are the, how, we're going to do that now. He's going to explain that. He says, logically investigate the nature of gross matter until you come to the conclusion that gross objects which are all alloys. You know what an alloy is? Mixture. Huh? Mixture. A mixture. Yeah, an alloy is a mixture. You mix a number of, in that, uh, we, we have a, a dancing Shiva in there that came from India, and it's made out of five different metals. So it's an alloy. It, that You have to make it out of five metals. Why would you want that Shiva made out of five metals? Huh? So symbols, symbols of the five elements. <laughs> so they make the she. They use five elements to make the the deity. It's a symbol of itself, as it appears in form. So, so, so we meditate on the nature of gross matter until you come to the conclusion that gross objects, which are are all alloys are devoid of joy. Now, if, if, you're, if, you, if you need to have physical sex, in other words, uh, physical sex, let's say, and you, you think the joy is coming from the rubbing, the meat rubbing on meat, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it's like like two, two steaks together. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. <laughs> this is this is called the this is called the food sheath. <laughs> that that meat tube is is meat. So, but I need to do that because it makes joy. Well, then you've got a little meditating to do. Huh? Understand? That's all. This is it's not. There's nothing. I know it's funny, but but it, this isn't profound. <laughs> this 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 may be difficult, but it's not profound. Because I I think I need somebody. You know, people just were so crazy about this social distancing. I was quite happy with it. I, I never. <laughs> well, our family, we, we weren't huggers. Nobody said I love you and hugged anybody. We just liked each other and did our duty. And, and when we were done doing our duty, we, the kids went out and played. And I don't know what my parents did. We didn't care. Nobody cared. And, and we never had to say I love you or whatever it was because uh, we just did our job. Yeah, huh? So, so, <laughs> so. But but look at how the people like got up in arms about it. They just couldn't stand it, and they couldn't keep hugging each other and kissing each other and doing all this stuff. And of course, the virus just loves that, huh? Vi oh yeah, let's get change, swap a little spit here, you know? Let's let's let, let's breathe all of our our germs into each other. That's a great idea, isn't it? You know? No, they didn't like that at all. They didn't want to be. But there's no joy in it, actually. The joy is all in me. Uh, understand? Reason, and what, what you do, reason that the joy you seek can only be what? The nature of the self-awareness. In other words, the joy is not in the object. Lesson number one. That's 
why it comes right at the beginning in the in, the, in my book uh, in the motivations. What is the, the the main topic? Joy is not in the object. It looks like it's in the object because when uh, when the meat rubs on the meat, joy comes. But where's the joy coming from? The absence of desire for the object. <laughs> The joy is not coming from the object. The joy is coming from the absence of desire for the object. Because when I have the object comes, uh, I no longer desire it. And when I no longer desire the object, what happens? I feel good. I'm experiencing my own nature then. I'm experiencing the bliss of anandam of myself at that moment. I'm just tricked. Maya's just fooled me. Fools everybody. It's just that uh, Ishwar is the greatest trickster. This what does this what does this practice do? <clears throat> it enhances dispassion <clears throat> and is a fundamental qualification for yoga and Vedanta. Fair enough. I don't need to harp on that topic anymore. Invest it, well, I will. <laughs> <laughs> investigate, again, so, this is Savichara, logically Savitarka, and investigate is Savichara. What's Vichara mean? Inquiry. Inquiry. Remember, I'm asking questions, I'm thinking. In, 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 Savitarka, I'm employing logic. There are just certain basic kinds of logic, inductive logic, deductive logic, and so forth and so on. And I just apply that logic. I'm not asking any question. Now here I'm asking some question, I'm investigating. So that's called Savichara. Investigate the mind. What? Until when? Well, the until means what? You don't have to investigate the mind, what? Until, uh, you only have to investigate it until it's clear what the mind does and that it's not yourself. Once that's clear that, that the mind isn't me, then you don't have to investigate it anymore. If, uh, but that's a hard one, because huh? the tendency to identify with it, in other words, to... to Allow the eye to jump over the over the Maya barrier, the Maya line here, and get itself involved in its feelings and emotions. That tendency is hardwired, isn't it? It's a basic orientation. It's it's our fundamental orientation, which is just backwards of how things are. Huh? Maya gets us ignorance, gets us right through being. We're all born ignorance, and mom and pop. They serve Ishwar, they serve ignorance as, be, as, as best they can. They, they make sure that I'm really ignorant and that I'm really, really chasing a whole bunch of stuff that's what is going to cause problems for me. But they don't know that's what they're doing. They think they're protecting me from this. God bless them. God bless them. Pointed little heads. They just don't get it. And they're not going to get it. So just pack it in and do it yourself. Figure it out. Listen to this and see if it isn't true. That's all. Until you see that gross objects stand alone as five elements. That's the Tad Matra teaching. We're not going to do that teaching uh, here. Uh, before they are made into alloys by the process of division and recombination. Because... Uh, because these things here, are, there are five of them, but they all come from five separate thoughts. The air, fire, water, earth, and space thought. Space thought comes first, and then uh, space, where's the space? Space thought comes first, and then air, fire, water, and earth. They logically, they, they split up and combine, divide and recombine according to a formula. Would have to be, wouldn't it? It'd have to be formulaic and mathematical, because... Uh, Otherwise, if, it's, if there's any, any randomness in the system, you're not going to get out of bed in the morning, are you? Hmm. 
If, if fire decides to be cold, just, just, it wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I'm so tired of being hot, I'll be cold today. Uh, what's going to happen to the, to the world? Mm -hmm. Grind to a halt. If, if, if water decides it isn't going to be wet, I guess that's what happens in COVID. I think the water, I think COVID dries up the water element so you can't taste, smell and taste. Because that, this whole area here, I, this is just, a, I'm just speculating, I'm not sure. But it seems logical. This whole area is covered with mucus. Mucus is water. And when that's dry, you can't taste anything. When there's the absence of water, you can't taste. This, this water element is associated with what? The tongue, the taste over here, you see? Each one of these elements is, is color-coded to connect here with one of these five instruments and over here with one of these five instruments. So they're all, it's all the color coding here is completely logical and, and, and basic and simple. Well, so it says here. So, 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 what, what do you, what do you do there? Uh, you, you, you investigate the mind until you see that gross objects stand alone as five elements, before they are made into alloys by the process of division and recombination. That's what panchikarana means. It means they they divide and then they recombine. One, it, this is why there's so many possibilities. This is why the, uh, in the world there are just infinite numbers of permutations and combinations. No, no two snowflakes are alike. <laughs> they say, huh? How many snow... Na, na, the Eskimos have 22 words for snowflakes. Now that's just the 22 categories of snowflakes. And then within the 22 categories there are billions of snowflakes, and none of those billions of snowflakes are exactly the same as any one of the other snowflakes. That's owing to this process that takes place here and creates this tremendous diversity that, that, that attracts us and, and bewilders us and awes us. You just can't. It's just amazing to see it. All, everywhere you look, huh? That no matter how deep you drill down into every single thing, huh, you see this amazing diversity continue to just unfold and unfold and unfold. Kind of like the Mandelbrot set. It's like that. <clears throat> and, and what? By this process, uh, they appear as visible, tangible elements, which is to say the world. So the world is built up out of these little Tiny units, <coughs> tiniest units. You can't even imagine them. This is what they call a quantum level, a quark level, and the I don't know what what's what's the what's the latest bosons. Is there something smaller than bosons? You don't know. I don't know. Anyway, doesn't know. Huh? There's no end to this uh, division, and so we're always coming up with a new name for for uh, when somebody wants to split up one of those elementary particles further, then they have to put a new name on it. I understand, that's all. <clears throat> this, it says, and this process is explained in detail in Shankara, Shankara Chai's Tattva Bodh. That's why we ask you to uh, to study Tattva Bodh first. Not just for that particular teaching, but, uh, but I, I, we can't explain it every time we teach, huh? yoga or Vedanta, we assume that you understand this, uh, so we say, please go and listen to that teaching and see how that works. That's going to, you know, there's not, nothing's going to convince you that you're not a doer like that teaching. <laughs> it'll, it'll loosen your hold, your, your handle, your grip on what? On objects, on the world. When you see that, that's why we do it. it. All of these teachings are meant to what develop this dispassion, this discrimination. 
And what does this inquiry do? This inquiry reveals that it is what? It is un unwise to depend upon experiences produced by sense objects. Meat on meat. <laughs> it's unwise to depend. Uh, it's okay, but don't, uh, don't, because every single sense object is unreliable. It's never the same from one moment to the next. At what point, huh? At what point uh, does it be, does it s cease to give you the joy? Like let's see, let's use sex again. Sex is such a great example. Because because right you're right in the middle of the orgasm, and what are you thinking? What are you, what what's your desire? You want it to last, don't you? Huh? You want it to last. Why do you want it to last? Think about it. Because it's, it's, it's not lasting, that's why. Because it's never going to last. Huh? It's, it, the moment uh, you get to here, mm -hmm. here isn't here anymore, here's here. And so on the way up, it all seems very wonderful, huh? Until what? You get to, to the, the zero sum point, and then what happens to the zero sum point? It all starts to disintegrate and go down. And then you end up right where you started. <laughs> you think you've got somewhere, and, and all you did was go up and come right back down to where you were at the beginning. So people tell you, oh, I was really had great sex. Oh, so? What's next? Oh, what did you do next? <laughs> oh, let's have some more great sex. Uh, How's that going to work? If it doesn't work once, it's not going to work twice. Because <laughs> it's a zero-sum game. <laughs> you know the story that, about the man and the woman who, <clears throat> who love sex, and they decide, oh, okay, I won't. <laughs> I won't tell that story. Either. I don't have to tell it because I got the laugh. I got the laugh without even telling it. Because that story is always good, isn't it? That's always good for a laugh. <laughs> Never tell Elena doesn't remember it, do you? <laughs> I'm just itching to tell it again. I don't know it either. But a couple of people don't know it, so. No, they don't. No, no we'll, we'll, we'll let them suffer. <laughs> <laughs> You should listen better to my talks. I always, <laughs> I always, uh, no, I don't always tell that story, but it's a great story. Yeah, there's no gain. For every gain, there's a loss. That's that's what zero sum means. Now, if you know a worldly person hates that, don't they? They hate that. They know that it's a zero sum, and they hate it. They don't want it to be that way, so they keep. <laughs> <coughs> trying to make it, trying to prove that it isn't that way by doing it over and over and over again. And they become addicted and com become compulsive and addicted and so forth and so on. And pretty soon the whole, what, the whole, as Gita says, it's a slippery slope right on down to what? He says, to total lack of discrimination and total misery. That's where you end up. If, if you're trying to, like, prove reality wrong, So, and then that, that so that's the two. One is the 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 gross matter, and then now this is subtle matter we just talked about. Now we're going to talk about anandam. He's going to talk about anandam. <clears throat> oh yeah, okay. We'll do that after the break because it's uh, we've done we've done an hour. Let's do that and then them after the break.